All right, welcome, thanks for joining us. All right, so we'll kick back in here. Uh, thanks, uh, welcome everyone, thanks for joining us. Appreciate uh, you, you, uh, your interest here in RF connector design. Um, I, I'm curious, are you guys uh, familiar with RF connector design or you use RF connectors? All of it, okay, fantastic. Well, with that in mind, um, for those that maybe are not uh, connector designers, you might be saying, hey, look, I use RF connectors, um, but I'm not actually designing them. And, you know, for, for that, maybe a lot of the talks on these types of things uh, would be, you know, hey, let's look at a frequency range, some kind of span, a configuration, and we can call it a day. But uh, today we're at the ANSYS booth, we're talking about simulation. That would be boring. We don't want to do that. So instead, uh, really what we're talking about is how we use ANSYS tools to overcome our RF design challenges. And I thought it'd be fun to uh, kick it off with an animation from the king of animations himself, Giuliano at ANSYS. I'm not sure Giuliano's here today, but wherever he is, uh, thanks for, for allowing me to borrow this. But I'm pretty sure that ANSYS believes this is what we do all day, every day. So again, I thought this would be a fun starting point. Now I'd like to argue that RF connector design is a little bit more complicated than this, um, but the truth is in this animation here, it's capturing really the fundamentals for RF interconnects and one of the fundamental concepts, which is uh, minimizing discontinuities. If at any point you hear me say we or us, just to quickly introduce who we are, we're SamTech. If you've not heard of SamTech, uh, we are an electrical internet connect, uh, excuse me, interconnect company and uh, we've got a large growing catalog of products, but on the high performance side of things, uh, we have some digital and multi-pin solutions, high speed, high density backplanes and arrays, some high speed uh, edge guard and mezzanine solutions, flyover technologies, some high performance optics. Uh, but on the RF side of things, we have some precision RF connectors and cable assemblies, as well as some innovative packaging and waveguide solutions. So uh, I did not introduce myself yet. My name is Michael Griesi. I am the uh, manager of the RF modeling and simulation team, which is why I'll be focusing here at IMS on the Precision RF solutions. So jumping into the technical content, um, RF connectors. On the left-hand side, we have this connector that is on a PCB. And if we look at this from a cartoon point of view, we can see a couple of things. One, we've got a cable with a connector on the end of it. That connector mates into some board mounted connector. And that connector is of course mounted on a PCB with in this case, a CPW, some kind of outer layer escape. We can imagine what might be on the other end of this cable assembly, maybe another connector, maybe another PCB, maybe that's being routed out with a strip line. Um, but the important part here from a system point of view is that we have a 50 ohm system. We have a 50 ohm PCB going into a 50 ohm connector, into a 50 ohm cable assembly, back through another 50 ohm connector into a 50 ohm uh, strip line in this case. And so if I'm looking at this from a system point of view, I'm saying, okay, look, everything in my system is 50 ohms and specifically everything in my transmission path is 50 ohms. And so what could go wrong, right? That's the question. Uh, we're gonna start um, with the, the goal here and I should back up for a moment just to preface that this presentation is broken up into three major parts. The first part is sort of a fundamentals background, which is, this is the beginning of that section. Um, from there, I'm going to talk about some of the ways that we at SamTech use ANSYS, um, specifically HFSS, for these RF connector designs and overcoming RF challenges, as I mentioned. Uh, and I'm also going to share after that, the third section is some ways that we use ANSYS tools other than HFSS, so uh, fluids, mechanical type simulations that ultimately feed into RF performance. But backing up to uh, the goal itself, um, what, do you, what are we trying to accomplish with an RF connector? Well, you have some board where you presumably want to either test or inject some kind of RF signal. So you're going to get a board connector, mount that on the board. You're gonna have some cable assembly. You're gonna mate that cable assembly to the connector. And this is where the magic happens. That RF connector disappears. And this is true really for, for any kind of connector, but disappear meaning from an electrical point of view. Uh, electrically disappear or electrically transparent. So that is one of our fundamental goals of an RF interconnect is that it's, it's invisible electrically. So uh, a good connector should really be the, the best piece of nothing that you've ever purchased and put on your board. Uh, I wanna quickly define though what I mean by electrical transparency. So oftentimes transparency is discussed in terms of impedance or minimizing discontinuities as we see in the bottom left of this slide. But really why are we doing this? this what's the point of minimizing discontinuities? It's to maximize the bandwidth. 
Okay, so bandwidth can, can mean a couple of things. For RF connectors, we're usually talking about up to some maximum bandwidth for the size of the, the, uh, the transmission line. But okay, what are we doing from a design point of view? What are we trying to optimize for that uh, design? And it's a transmission line, right? We're trying to maximize transmission. We're trying to minimize reflection. So this is typical S-parameter type analyses when we're trying to design and optimize some kind of RF interconnect. In effort to sort of go run through this a bit quickly, um, so for time constraints, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the fundamentals, but there are a couple of points that I want to highlight uh, in this section. And the first one I alluded to on the previous slide, which is coaxial sizes. So in the RF world, we're often dealing with a single-ended coaxial transmission line. A coax is nice, it's a controlled impedance, um, but there's a relationship with bandwidth and the size of the coax. And so, just to quickly run through this slide here, um, there is a cutoff to a coax. This is going to be your maximum frequency of which you transition from a TEM wave and you start uh, uh, exciting a TE11 wave. And that is not where you want to be transmitting your signal in. You want to be transmitting in a TEM. So for a, a coaxial cable, there's a formula that you could calculate what that co uh, excuse me that cutoff frequency is going to be. But from a size point of view and from a bandwidth point of view, what's important to note is that the cutoff frequency is inversely proportional to the diameter of the coax. And this should make sense because frequency of is of course inversely proportional to wavelength. And so the basic takeaway from this slide is that smaller size, smaller diameter coax is a higher frequency or a higher bandwidth product. And so when we populate uh, the frequency ranges for these different size connectors we see up there, uh, something like a 2.92 millimeter coax is going to have a 40 gigahertz bandwidth, whereas if you go to a smaller diameter, like a 135, or I should really have a one millimeter up here, would take you for up to 90 or 110 gigahertz respectively. This looks at that previous formula, but from an HFSS simulation point of view, was that uh, we're going to quickly look at an air-filled coax. This is just a coaxial structure. There's no connectors or anything, so just a simple model. Um, and a, a dielectric filled, this is PTFE filled, but this slide is showing us that both uh, coaxes have a 50 ohm transmission impedance, even though they might have different bandwidths. And one other point I want to make is, uh, if you have access to HFSS, uh, a lot of users don't realize this, you also have access to a circuit simulation tool inside of Electronics Desktop. And so we're going to look quickly at a circuit simulation for some cascaded or concatenated uh, coaxial structures using Electronics Desktop Circuit. You can also link these to your HFSS design or vice versa. You right click copy the HFSS design inside of the project manager and right click paste that uh, design into your circuit schematic. Um, the green trace that we're seeing on the slide is showing the visoir from a circuit simulation of cascaded S parameters. So the model that we're trying to simulate is shown in the, in the image there where we have a air filled coax that has a PTFE uh, or dielectric filled coax in series with it. And if I'm looking at a circuit simulation perspective, then I have a 50 ohm section in series with a 50 ohm section. And if I think back to the system impedance example that we showed at the beginning of the presentation, 50 ohms into 50 ohms means I've minimized discontinuities. I should have low reflections. That's my hope. And if I run a circuit simulation with just passive S parameters, that's exactly what I see. But if I simulate this cable, um, again, these two structures in series inside of HFSS, this is now a field simulator, full wave simulation. HFSS says, well, hang on. Actually, we are seeing some reflections, uh, even though you have a 50 ohm section followed by a 50 ohm section. And so what gives? What did we do wrong? And the answer is, uh, in the bottom right hand uh, image here, is that a circuit simulation tool is going to assume that it's operating in TEM. Or another way of saying it is, it doesn't have any knowledge of the field behavior of this structure, where HFSS does. And so on the bottom right hand side, you can see coming into the air filled coax uh, are TEM waves. Coming out of the dielectric filled coax are also TEM waves. But at that interface between the two, there's non-TEM behavior. So the point of this whole section here is that even though, again, we had a 50 ohm section going into a 50 ohm section, this change in geometry and change in materials actually did introduce some discontinuity. We can see this inside of HFSS. We can see this in the TDR plot that shows some dip in the impedance profile. And so fundamentally, this is a 3D effect, right? The discontinuity is visible inside of the 3D fields, 
um, where it was not understood from just a circuit simulation point of view. This is the point that really this section is trying to make. If you're looking at system design from uh, this perspective on the right hand side where we have you know, a 50 ohm board, a 50 ohm connector, a 50 ohm uh, coaxial cable, then we could assume that, hey, everything's going to work out just fine. But the reality is anytime you have a change in dimensions and or a change in material characteristics, even though it's 50 ohms on both sides of that interface, you have a discontinuity. And so this simple example is really highlighting the value of what 3D simulation can highlight and it's contradiction, contradicting the assumption that a 50 ohm system is going to be reflection free. Okay, so from there, I want to jump into um, some of the examples of how we at Samtech use HFSS to overcome these uh, get discontinuity issues and optimize our connectors. The first thing here is just a, a basic anatomy of a, an RF connector. So if you've not seen the inside of an RF connector before, it looks something like this. This is not a real product that we're showing here, but it has uh, you know, some of the realistic components that you're gonna see inside of a connector. And if you'll take away the conclusion we had on the previous section, anytime you have a change in geometry or material, you have a discontinuity. Um, in this example, we see some slotted contact. We'll have another uh, connector or adapter that's mated to the front end there. There's a capture bead that is holding that center contact in place. You might have some changes in diameters to compensate for differences in impedances, uh, again, discontinuities. Uh, you might have another dielectric support, and then that's going to terminate into maybe a coaxial cable or a PCB. And so, again, thinking about um, the, the, the problem with discontinuities, I challenge you to very quickly see if you can count these discontinuities, and you got to go quick because there's a lot of them, right? They're all over the place. And so, um, hopefully, the challenge is starting to formulate for you guys to, to understand that, again, just assuming I have a 50 ohm system is incorrect. There are discontinuities all over the place. So let's take a more concrete example. Here we've got a 2.92 millimeter uh, edge launch, and the cross section that we can see on here is intentionally oversimplified uh, to sort of highlight the challenge that we're faced with in a connector design. So on the left hand side of the cross section, we have a 292 interface, at least dimensionally speaking. It is an, uh, an air filled transmission line. And on the right hand side, we want to escape out onto a PCB. So what challenges do we have in front of us? Well, the first thing I mentioned on the previous slide, which is we have to somehow hold that center conductor in place. It's unfortunately not gonna just magically float there. So uh, we need to have some dielectric, some plastics basically, that are going to be inside of our connector, even though we don't really want them from an electrical point of view. The second thing is we need to maintain that standard 2.92 millimeter interface dimensions because that's our connection to the outside world. We have an adapter, we have a cable, we need to be able to mate to it. But we want to change that, those dimensions to go all the way in this example down to a seven mil diameter pin that's going to be attached to a PCB. And so we have materials, we have uh, changes in diameters that we have to deal with when we're trying to create this electrically transparent connector. And oh, by the way, make sure that this is manufacturable and we end up with something electrically transparent. So just keep these details in the back of your mind. So how do we do this at Samtech? Well, the starting point is just that. It's a starting point, right? And so uh, we're using Excel calculators. Um, generally speaking, as a, as a starting point, you can Google these, you can download these. Um, Samtech, like other connector companies, we have uh, you know, our own formulas that we're constant, constantly trying to update and improve so we have a better starting point. But ultimately, this is our best guess as a starting point. We'll draw some model based on that best guess, but at some point, we're importing that model into ANSYS HFSS and running simulations. But what's gonna be critical here is material definition, so accurate frequency dependent material properties, as well as accurate dimensions. Why? because of the conclusion in the previous uh, section, right? It, everything that's ultimately defining impedance and therefore discontinuities is geometry and material. And then the last thing is when we're looking at just the connector as a starting point, we want to isolate just the connector. So we'll strip out all of the um, details on the outside of the transmission line that are not important to optimizing that, that uh, connector because look, fast simulations are just as important as accurate. And here are the initial results for that design. Uh, we have our reflections in Visual on the left-hand side and the associated impedance prof uh, profile through the TDR on the right-hand side. And I'm not going to say this is good or bad necessarily, it's just our starting point, right? And so the question is, what can we do from here? Can we change some dimensions? Can we change materials to optimize this connector to be more electrically transparent? Or in other words, 
reduce the reflections on the left-hand plot. I'm not going to teach you guys how to use optometrics inside of uh, HFSS. You guys can talk to ANSYS about that. They'll teach you how to use it. Um, but essentially what was done here was parameterizing the model and running it through parametric sweeps, optimization algorithms to try and find a lower reflection, so more optimized design. And so that's what we see on the left-hand side. But on the right-hand side, we again see that associated impedance profile in the TDR. But what's a little bit um, deceiving is remember, we had all those little discontinuities inside of the connector that are not necessarily readily apparent in these curves. And so uh, one of the questions from a design point of view is, where are they located? If I have a discontinuity at this position, this position, this position, how do I correlate my TDR plot, which is a time uh, domain on the x-axis, to some physical position inside of the connector? And the answer is, TDR markers. So if we take a driven terminal design inside of HFSS, we can copy that, paste it, and start a new design that is a transient solution type. And so yes, you heard me right, most people do not realize that there is a transient solver inside of HFSS. In fact, there are a couple of different transient solvers inside of there. Uh, but once you copy and paste that driven terminal design, change the solution type to transient, and set up your excitation. If you want to look at a TDR, uh, it's this is in the time domain, so your setup is also in the time domain, unlike a frequency domain solver, right? And so uh, generally in RF, we're looking for some bandwidth. bandwidth. A 2.92 millimeter uh, uh, bandwidth is 40 gigahertz. So if I want 40 gigahertz in my simulation of spectral content, I need to know what to set up my rise time for in the TDR. And so uh, HFSS is gonna do this math for you in the background, but it's helpful to know what that math is as a starting point. Uh, which is a time bandwidth, um, uh, maybe they call it a time frequency, time bandwidth uh, product, which is 0.9. So I can take 0.9, divide that by 40 gigahertz, which is my, uh, my span, or my bandwidth, and I get a 22 and a half picosecond rise time. So that's how I'm gonna set up my problem inside of HFSS. And just to note, uh, HFSS, again, is going to set up the bandwidth, so that 40 gigahertz, it's gonna set that up for you and the setup for the mesh is going to be done automatically. It's gonna set a mesh frequency to half the spectral bandwidth, 20 gigahertz, and then do a, a frequency sweep from zero to 40 gigahertz. The only thing that I input in from this perspective is the 22 and a half picoseconds for my uh, transient simulation. From there, you can save the field results inside of HFSS. You're gonna place a point as a marker, essentially, inside of uh, the, the domain and plot your field as that pulse, that Gaussian pulse, propagates past each of those points, uh, I, can, I can then turn that into some maximum E field as a plot, and now I can correlate that position in time with some physical location in the, uh, the connector. So something like this. I have the, the red dots are indicating where they're physically placed, and now I know how to correlate the TDR time domain to my physical location. This is how I can figure out where discontinuities are located that's gonna help me out in my optimization. Um, oh, and I'm sorry, one just last detail um, from, from a solver perspective. So I introduced the transient solver here. Um, there is, uh, I mentioned there are a couple different transient solvers. There's a discontinuous Galerkin time domain, a finite element time domain solver. Whether you're using either of those time domain solvers or um, in this example, we also have rectilinear elements and curvilinear elements in the frequency domain solver. If you set these up properly, you can get the same answer with any of these uh, solvers. The differences you see between these curves at the beginning is a fundamentally uh, uh, a difference in a time domain solver. You have propagation delay for that pulse to reach um, the, the domain. And then the one thing I will point out is that the FEM solver, the frequency domain um, solver, it, the uh, frequency dependent losses in that frequency domain solver are going to be greater. I believe this is a more realistic um, uh, uh, loss that it's accounting for. So you should see higher losses in the FEM over time, over distance. Um, but nonetheless, again, basically the same answer between all the solvers. So, okay, I started talking about why, why would we want to do this. Um, and one of the things I mentioned is when you're doing the optimization, knowing where these discontinuities exist can help you in your optimization process. But one of the bigger things I would argue is correlation with measurement. If anybody's tried to correlate a simulated TDR with a measured TDR, uh, especially when a measured TDR is not exactly what you're expecting, it can be a challenging process. 
And so um, having markers in your simulation domain give you a point that you can line up with something in your measurement domain where you say, hey, I know where this uh, interface is. For example, you can align those features between the simulated and the measured, um, and then you can overlay and optimize or if you need to troubleshoot. And from an accuracy point of view, how does it work? Uh, well, here is an actual comparison of one of our designs. So the red curve is the simulated um, predicted results. And uh, thankfully, the yellow and blue curve uh, curves are the measured results that agree very well with the, uh, the design itself. And so the takeaway here for me anyway is that HFSS and the person that was running HFSS um, did their job, meaning they had the correct model, they set up the problem uh, correctly, and those that were manufacturing the actual connector built what was on the, the drawing. And so everybody did their job, we had a predicted model, and we had a built um, measurement that showed the exact same result. Okay, all of that was really focused on reflections, so minimizing uh, reflections. Let's talk about maximizing transmission. Inside of the connector, again, we have some plastic beads that are holding this center conductor in place. And one of the things we need to concern ourselves is what we call bead modes. This is essentially a mode that exists in band where energy gets trapped inside of the dielectric. Uh, here we're looking at a 2.4 millimeter instead of the 292. Um, and you'll see why it makes a good example here. But if I run a simulation of this 2.4 millimeter bead and I look at the insertion loss, um, a, a 2.4 bandwidth is 50 gigahertz. We're seeing out to 60 gigahertz in the simulation. The insertion loss plot looks very clean. I have no suck outs. And that's what we want. But what I didn't say is that was in a driven terminal um, simulation, which means we're simulating the dominant mode or the first mode. If I take this same geometry, do a driven modal simulation, simulate three modes, I'm gonna have my, my first mode, my TEM dominant, I'm gonna have my TE11 in the first degenerate mode. Now suddenly I have something popping out that's a little suck out that is beneath 50 gigahertz. Now I have an in-band suck out, I have a problem. And if I would've just ran that previous simulation and went to build it, we could run into a situation where we have products in the field that have suck outs in band, bad news. Now, it, the reason I, I mentioned that, that uh, I, I would explain why I looked at the 2.4 millimeter is one, well, we didn't see in the driven uh, motor, excuse me, driven terminal simulation, we didn't see the suck out. Sometimes it does come out if it's strong enough, um, but here we see it pop out with the um, driven modal. But the other thing that's nice about it is because that, that suck out looks kind of small on the insertion loss plot, now it may be much larger in the real world. That's why you want to catch these. Um, but if I plot the S21 for modes two and three, then that suck out pops right out. I can very clearly identify, okay, I have an in-band suck out at 49 gigahertz. I need to do something about it. We have a couple of methods of pushing that mode out of band. Uh, but if and when we do that, I need to then go back and uh, reiterate on Viswar because I've changed something, right? I've changed the diameter, I've changed the material. So let me run through a couple of uh, takeaways um, from that section. Driven terminal. Uh, while, while it was uh, an issue when we looked at that suck out from the insertion loss plot, driven terminals are primary workhorse. We're doing most of our work with a driven terminal solution. We're quantifying our discontinuities, minimizing reflection, maximizing bandwidth. That's ultimately where we're doing most of our work. The transient solver, however, was a nice uh, addition that allowed us to place markers inside of our domain. And by the way, once you have the, the answer to where your marker location is in the time domain, it's obviously the same thing in the frequency domain. It's a location and time related to a physical location in the model. But then we looked at the driven modal because driven terminal is only my first or dominant mode from a simulation point of view. And in the real world, Modes are going to excite on their own. In the simulation world, I want to make sure I'm exciting modes that might introduce a problem like a suck out um, in my design. And so we use driven modal to simulate three modes uh, and identify suck out. Okay, that was all on the connector side of things. Let's think about a board launch for an RF connector now. Uh, this is another topic that I'm not going to really spend a lot of time. I could spend three days on RF launch design and us not cover uh, everything. But there is a, um, a white paper, and the exact name of it is not coming to mind, but at samtech.com, we have uh, an RF launch white paper that is a good starting point. One of our colleagues, uh, Sandeep, put this together and goes through some of the basic fundamentals of an RF launch. But the reason for including it in this presentation is because just like in the connector, you should see a bunch of discontinuities, right? A change in uh, geometry and a change in material. 
Now we have ways of trying to match these impedances, minimize these discontinuities. Just a couple examples are um, removing stubs, adding anti-pads, shifting those anti-pads, back drilling. There are other methods of doing this, but the basic concept doesn't change. I'm minimizing discontinuities, trying to maximize bandwidth. Um, and I won't run through the details because they're essentially the same kind of details that we saw before, but if you're modeling correctly the uh, connector on the PCB, optimizing that launch, you should be able to get a simulation result that looks something like this and hopefully correlates very well as we did with our measured impedance. So the point here is that you can get measurement accuracy out of a simulation provided you have the appropriate details. What are those details, material characteristics, and geometry? If you have those and you're, you're simulating like you test, you're gonna get the same answer. On the transmission, excuse me, transmission side of things, there's two things I wanna point out that are critical factors um, from an insertion loss point of view. The first one is uh, for accurate PCB modeling, your, uh, your dielectrics, and this is true in the connector too, really, but anisotropic material and frequency dependencies uh, on your dielectrics are very important, but something that's uh, extremely important for insertion loss on a PCB in particular is surface roughness. Uh, particularly if you're going over 10 gigahertz, over 30 gigahertz worth of bandwidth, if you want to get the, the correct insertion loss, then you should be using finite conductivity boundaries to account for surface roughness. And here we're looking at uh, uh, the, the Hure. Again, if you're going into high frequencies, you're wanting to use the Hure snowball approximation. Um, we have a couple of methods at Samtech to extract these values, but the takeaway is the same as the frequency domain. If you have uh, you know, the correct material properties, the correct surface roughness, you can get a simulation insertion loss plot that very well correlates with your measured insertion loss. Okay, and like connectors, PCBs also have suckouts, and sometimes they happen as a surprise. So here's a surprise suckout that we got in the lab, um, and uh, we see that at about 50 and 58 gigahertz. And it turns out the reason for this was there were some geometry details that were not included in the model. Okay, so we had not a complete model, it turns out. But the good news was once we updated our model, added those uh, geometry details, in the insertion loss plot, those suckouts popped right out. Um, but the not necessarily bad news, but at the time, we just didn't know where it was coming from yet. Was it in the connector? Was it in the board? And so plotting the, uh, the fields inside of the connector and the board allowed us to troubleshoot, identify where was this suckout coming from. And in this case, we noticed that there was some energy circulating around the escape at 50 and 58 gigahertz. So we said, okay, uh, maybe this has something to do with it. We looked at a couple of uh, uh, iterations and options for the board design and saw, you know, hey, if we just increase the diameter of this via, we can suppress these modes, at least in simulation. And so the hope was that this was going to be a good solution in the real world. And that's what we did. What we're looking at here, the black trace was our original results with the surprise suckouts at 50 and 58 gigahertz. The red trace was actually a rework that we did in the lab to try and verify that you know, we had some confidence this was going to fix the problem. And the green trace, which is thankfully the best looking trace, was a rebuild um, with the changes, the modifications, and we were able to uh, take care of those suckouts. Another thing from a maximizing transmission point of view is just energy loss. So this could be radiated energy, it could be absorbed energy, whatever the case may be. But I'll focus your attention on the right hand side. It could also be uh, anti-pad leakage into another layer. So I mentioned, hey, anti-pads are great for matching impedances, but a downside is you're gonna leak energy into a layer that you're not necessarily transmitting on. And so one thing we wanted to figure out was, okay, uh, we know that we're going to, I mean, anything's gonna have loss, right? Any transmission line's gonna have loss, but we wanted to try and quantify how much of the energy that's being lost is leaking into another layer? How big of a problem is this? So uh, the first thing that we started with in HFSS is just calculating loss factor. This is just the magnitude of your S11 and your S21 and relating that to 100% power. This means that you, uh, this is, excuse me, this is energy that is not at port one and port two. You don't know where it is, but it's not at port one and port two, right? So you're not maximizing that transmission. But then the question is, okay, so how much of that energy is because of that anti-pad leakage? And uh, the answer to that was using the fields calculator. If you've not used the fields calculator inside of HFSS, I would encourage you to for two reasons. One, it's a very powerful tool. Two, there is a learning curve, so start learning it now. Um, but once you figure it out, um, and this shows at the bottom left here, the fields calculator uh, formula that was used, 
what we were doing was uh, looking at the power flow through a surface on the anti-pad, looking at as a ratio of the power flow that was going into our domain, so our port one essentially, and looking at as a percentage. So the red curve that you see on the right-hand trace is energy loss or the loss factor, and then those PL dots that you see beneath that curve is how much energy was being lost into that uh, unwanted layer. So these are some other factors. Everything that I've talked about has been inside of ANSYS HFSS from an EM or an RF perspective. However, there are things that impact the signal path that are not necessarily uh, electromagnetic in nature. They're more mechanical or fluids. Uh, here we're looking at a essentially a fluids problem, and I would encourage you guys to take a look at this webinar we did last year. It's called Impacts of Solder Reflow on High Bandwidth RF Connectors. In this webinar, we go from, as this uh, slide shows, getting from something catastrophic where the connector wasn't even connecting onto the board, we had a tombstoning effect, uh, and going through some of the challenges we faced to increase the bandwidth, ultimately that was uh, related to solder reflow. And I'll highlight um, one, one of the last things that we looked at uh, to really push the bandwidth uh, to its maximum where it's currently at was we noticed that solder was wicking up the connector underneath uh, uh, and, and up the pin. And so we modeled this inside of HFSS on the right hand side. The problem with it um, wasn't just that the solder was wicking, but there was a ton of variability inside uh, or about how much that, that distance was that the solder was wicking. So we had a ton of variability in our measurements. Another way to look at this problem is, if you watch this animation on the right-hand side, uh, modeling this solder reflow inside of ANSYS Fluent and trying to figure out, because I'm a double E, I don't know what solder is going to do, where is this going? But it also allows us to try some new geometry inside of HFSS, hand this over to our fluids experts and see, you know, what do we need to do to control the solder flow and ultimately maximize our bandwidth? And the outcome, um, from, from that and you know one of the conclusions, uh, spoiler alert, if you go watch the, uh, the webinar, is that we did maximize our, uh, uh, our bandwidth up to about 55 gigahertz from before it was at 45 with all that variation. I have one more example for you guys, which was, okay, I mentioned the challenges for solder reflow. So one alternative to traditional solder mounted connectors is compression mount connectors. And so we have some compression mount connector options at, at Samtech, but one of the other nice benefits of a compression mount is you can take them off and use them again, so they're reusable. Um, but they don't come with, without their own challenges. And so this is another webinar we did, uh, I don't know, a couple of months ago, earlier this year. Uh, you can look up mechanical considerations for compression mounted RF connectors if you want to see the deep dive on this. But the highlights are this, we took uh, a compression mount and we posed a, a hypothetical question. What if that pin, because it's compression mounted, pushes down into the PCB pad, what would the effect be on the, uh, on the electrical performance? And we noticed on the top left, there's an impedance profile. As the pin pushed down into the pad, impedance dropped. And on the bottom left-hand side, visual reflections increased. So if this occurs, this is a problem. This is gonna degrade electrical performance. But at this point, this was hypothetical. Does this happen, and if so, to what extent? So working with our mechanical team, uh, they ran a bolt pretension simulation inside of ANSYS Mechanical. We took these results as an STL, brought them into ANSYS Discovery um, to do STL cleanup, convert that over to a solid model that we could then bring back into HFSS and analyze the results for deformed uh, geometry inside of HFSS. So these are just a couple of examples of uh, you know, how we're using other ANSA solutions that ultimately feed back into an electromagnetic solution inside of HFSS. And my last section is customer support, which is this. I mentioned um, you know, we could do a couple of days on RF launch. Uh, and so one of the things that is true for you know, any, uh, anybody using a connector is you're sort of on the hook for figuring out how to integrate that connector into your design, into your PCB. And so um, one of the ways that we like to help our customers with that is we provide reference launches that, that they can use. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time, some of these examples like I showed you here, trying to solve this problem already. If there's anything that we can do to help our customers um, have a good starting point, we can, and if there's answers we can question along, excuse me, uh, questions we can answer along the way, we will. And the other thing, um, I don't have enough time for this uh, short little commercial, but let me see if I can pause it right. Here we go. Um, in case you're not familiar with HFSS 3D components, 
they are a fully encapsulated HFSS uh, project, essentially. So more than just the model, the geometry, the CAD, it includes material characteristics, it includes any kind of boundary conditions, excitations, et cetera. Um, but what a component allows us to do is hide and encrypt any data that we wouldn't typically share that has IP in it. And so this is something that we can share with our customers. This is the digital equivalent of going and buying a connector from Samtech, putting this onto a PCB, measuring it in the lab. The difference being, that from a measurement point of view, you should have already designed and built a PCB. From a simulation point of view, you can take that virtual model, put it into HFSS, and design your board with our connector. And so you can make sure that you have an optimized launch the same way that we optimized and designed our PCB. So that's available for customers as well. Okay, that brings me to the end. There's one technical takeaway that I hope uh, all engineers take from this. Discontinuities are more than just characteristic impedance. I've encountered this a lot in my career where people say, I don't understand. I have a 50 ohm connector, I have a 50 ohm board, I have a 50 ohm cable. Why doesn't it work? It's because discontinuities are all over the place. Look for changes in geometry, changes in materials. These will introduce discontinuities. Um, the second thing is, uh, if you have access to simulation tools, uh, explore all the solution types. So we looked at ANSYS HFSS, I talked about uh, driven terminal, driven modal, transient solver, uh, but there's also an eigenmode solver, an IE and an SBR solver if you're doing antenna applications, and I briefly went through the circuit simulation tool inside of Electronics Desktop, but the point is, if you spend some money on a solver, use it to its fullest extent. There could be other solutions inside of that package that could help you solve the problem and ultimately make a, a good product or in, maybe in this case, integrate uh, Samtech's solution onto your PCB. Likewise, get to know your simulation tool. I didn't spend a lot of time on this in this presentation, but understand what every button setting field does inside of your simulation tool. And the reason for this is the better you are using the tool, obviously the more accurate of a solution you're going to get, but you can also optimize your workflow to get a fast simulation. If you can iterate a million times, you're gonna have a much better chance of finding the best design, finding problems in your design uh, before you ultimately go to build. Uh, also, correlate your models. I showed some examples of correlation. I would highly recommend it because the more you can get your model to look like what you're measuring in the lab, then the more likely you are to solve problems. But from an engineer's point of view, you're going to make some exciting discoveries. You're gonna learn some things along the way. Um, and to me, that's what's fun about being an engineer. My last bullet here is get to know your RF connector vendor. So again, my name is Michael Griesi. I'm with Samtech. We do have a booth here at IMS. So if you have some questions that you'd like me to dive into from this presentation, um, please stop by, I will be there. And uh, if you've heard enough of me, that's fine. I have some colleagues over there that would love to uh, meet you as well, answer questions, and we'd love to hear what kind of work you guys are doing. So with that, I appreciate everybody's attention. Okay, thanks. Taking it easy on me, appreciate it guys.